Hello and welcome back to part three of three in this series where Daryl shows you how to draw a more realistic horse. Uh, in the first video, Daryl shared some simple, quick, effective tricks to add depth and dimension, dimension to your horse drawings quickly. In the second video, he covered a small patch of the horse and showed you how to start drawing in the fur, the hair. And uh, in this third video, Daryl's going to take that same patch of fur and hair and he's going to to refine it and show you how to smooth out the coat effectively. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and let Daryl get to it. Hey, I want to welcome you back to this third stage of this little demonstration I've been trying to share with you to just try to give you a little bit of an opportunity to not only start out right, but maybe have at least a direction on how to hey, finish with uh, some great uh, realism, uh, depth, all these different things that go together and making a great uh, drawing. And uh, it can get a little confusing when you're working with something that has hair. I think uh, some people that uh, want to draw dogs and cats will experience some of these same things. And uh, there's many of the same principles that are involved, as I've talked about. But with hair, uh, with fur, shorter fur especially, you can dictate the length of it uh, by a few little tricks. And so let's go ahead and see what we can add to what I did in the last video and, uh, and try to develop this or at least give you a, a good uh, direction again uh, to continue on developing yours as you uh, may even try this uh, horse in the video that we're making available to you. Um, I talked to you about before trying to not get into the mindset where you see hair and you get so concentrating on doing each stroke that you get the rose. In fact, I'm just going to review a couple of those things. We don't want to have everything so uniform that it starts creating rows. In fact, I'm going to get a little closer. Just don't want to get out of the camera. So we don't want just almost perfectly spaced, uh, you know, lines on here. And we don't want to even come close to having something that's all the same length in all the same row. And uh, so we create things that are like sections. We want to be able to toss it up a little bit. And we'll notice that, um, and I guess I will have to move this a few times here, you'll notice that the hair on this, you know, it, it has a flow. And it goes with the contour. And as it comes over maybe a vein or a muscle structure here, that it will come over here and it'll start turning down and this is the deepest part. And then it comes back out again and changes directions a little bit. A wonderful flow to it though. And then it comes down and it goes around this jaw. And you remember uh, in the last video I was showing you how I often will go ahead and show a darker edge like on that jaw by, by just uh, making sure that I bring the strokes together at the bottom. So I have that chance to, you know, when I'm doing it from the top, maybe it's uh, the top of the uh, hair on a, uh, on a human's head, I, I will often use this opportunity to show that it's a little darker when it goes to the back maybe. And if you're drawing bangs, well, it'll get a little bit uh, lighter and it'll get a little bit wider. And, uh, and yet we don't want a line to demonstrate uh, a hair. In most cases, you're never going to have that happen unless it's some grizzled look. You might have to put a, a few dark hairs in a grizzled beard of a, of a gray beard on a guy. Or maybe there's some dogs that have a few stray uh, darker hairs in a white patch. Well, yes, we will have to compensate. But overall, we don't want to have uh, these hairs representing the hair. I mean, these lines representing the hair. Because what we're really doing is creating a negative. And this is one of the things that people struggle with. We are having white spaces then. If we get too carried away with having these become hairs, the white spaces start acting like they are light spaces down in between the hair. Well, that's the opposite of what we would see. Because everything goes, when it goes to where it's darker, it gets darker. And if you can remember that rule, it is really going to help you. Because when I'm using my tapered stroke and I'm constructing maybe this uh, looping uh, on the uh, as I do my stroke, 
I'm already taking advantage of the fact that I have something getting darker to where it goes to where there's less light. Now in here, if I uh, am going to reverse that negative that we've created, I'm going to take a couple of those hairs and I'm going to just create a shadow in between. Now this became the hair. And just that quick, you can change the whole dynamics. Now because of the way we've shaped this, the way it got a little darker maybe at the top, uh, because it's going to get more enclosed and allow less light in there, now we're starting to suggest to our minds that we are actually looking at uh, what's left as the hair instead of what we did initially as the hair. Because people struggle with having white spaces, and so they just keep drawing, keep drawing, keep drawing, and sometimes just don't realize that all they need to do is reverse it out just a little bit, and now all those white spaces will start getting into the right category. You see how we start having depth. I hope you can, you can uh, visualize this as I'm explaining it. Now, on the edge again, as we're coming around this horse's jaw like this, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to come over here and kind of loop it. But now we don't want all of our strokes to be the same length, and we don't want them to all be in rows, and yet we have to get something on there so that we can start working with it. We also don't want these to just have contours that just follow the contour and become long, long. Well, that, if it's too long, we're going to have a hard time having it represent anything other than a mane. Perfect for the mane, but we don't want that to be for the short hairs on the, on the horse's skin. Um, I always don't know what to call that. It's just hard. I, it isn't hide yet because it'd have to be cured to be hide. Uh, but anyway, uh, what do we do when we start just getting a feel for the flow? Well, that's fine. Just make sure that you don't make so many strokes that it starts becoming solid. Because we want to have those white spaces show through and we don't want to lose track of what we're trying to draw. Now, I realize there's some horses with a real sheen to their coat, and we can gradually get that direction, but it's probably better to show some texture. And in the texture, you'll see quite a bit of variance. You'll see how, you know, there's little dark places and there's light places. That is because all these little short hairs are ending up with different lengths. They may, you know, kind of go up at the end. They may go down at the end. Uh, they're, they're curved differently, but the, because they're short, they all have their own little facet, and yet they're all cooperating to go in basically the same direction. Can you see this, though? It comes down, then it gets more concentrated. That's why this is darker. Now we have a place where there's less light in this deeper area, and it gives us a wonderful opportunity to show that it's gone over and changed depth and dimension, and then it continues on around this contour and down to the darker side. Now, we don't want to have a place become all the same, so the fact that we have all this variance in here is really great. And if we treat this right, we can now take this, uh, this drawing here, this part of the drawing, and we can shorten up some of these strokes. Initially, you may see something lighter, lighter, and this was kind of just a guide. And so what I want to do is I want to make sure I'm working with a sharp pencil and I'm not going like this because that'll start adding grooves and it'll start, you know, uh, making it less possible for you to regulate the amount of pressure you're using. Uh, it's best to use the grade of the pencil, in my opinion, and learn how to just get enough out of this pencil to where it is ready to, you're ready to move on to the next one. And so I'm going to go ahead and use this... Uh, HB just a little bit here. And one of the things that you might find useful, as I do, is that I like to uh, not only have that sharp pencil, but I like to rotate it. You'll see that I'm rotating it in my hand. Now, it's a subconscious thing. I've just gotten in the habit of doing that. But basically what it's doing is it's always sharpening the pencil. And so if you realize you're having to go to your pencil sharpener too much or it seems like quite a bit, you're probably pushing that point right at the paper and it's wearing the tip off all the time. And if you start getting real thick lines here, it won't be near as effective. And there's nothing wrong with going to the pencil sharpener. I'm not trying to say don't sharpen your pencil, only you know keep it sharp by uh, rotating your pencil. 
But also, these aren't perfect parallel strokes. They're not like this, where they're all the same spacing. They are like, like this. I'm not worrying about you know, uh, the direction of each individual stroke, but what I am worried about is that overall, I'm turning a corner. I'm, I'm looking for darks and lights because of how many strokes I put in there. And, uh, and, and yet, these variances in, in, in a curve and length are what is going to help us create this. It's going to help us create a few places where we can even make the Vs, like I was talking about, even though it's very short here. We still want to accomplish something very similar. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start making uh, some varied lengths, not too long, and I'm not going to worry about it actually almost crisscrossing, you know, with the other hairs. And I can make these I don't want to make them too dark, but I can make these a little darker and always tap them off, like I showed you the other day. Not only with the rounded end of the uh, uh, kneaded eraser, as this is my favorite shape, uh, I can always come back in and I can tap out a value and, uh, and lighten it up. And especially if I haven't put too much pressure. So that's one reason, one of the many reasons, that I really encourage you to work through some of those exercises, like the patch exercise, and become very familiar with the pressure, the sound, the feel, and all those things. And they'll all be just automatic indicators after a while for you to make some adjustments. If you start seeing wider lines, then by all means, sharpen your pencil. But when I go ahead and I'm crossing over, I'm actually creating places where I can actually make a, a V. I think I'm on the wrong side of the paper of all things. Here's the teacher. I always recommend you work on the back side of the paper. And this is just a little bit coarse. I think I, in a hurry, I tried to get make sure this was ready. And, and so it's adding a little more grain. And that's another good reminder, too, because when you're working with something that you know, is kind of a subliminal texture like this, and it's important to get the lines clean so it reads well, then you want to make sure that you are on the right side of the paper. Uh, a slick paper just would never do, as far as I'm concerned. It does some nice things. There's a time and place for these smooth uh, varieties of vellum, and, uh, and they always are uh, going to be an advantage when you're drawing a particular thing. But they usually will not give you as much... Uh, texture. They won't give you as much uh, range of value because after a while your pencil just slides over the surface and it no longer uh, leaves anything behind because it's too slick. And if nothing else it'll start creating uh, slick and then it'll grab, you know, slide and grab and slide and grab and, uh, and it just won't be uh, a real consistent or help you have this random stroke. Because sometimes you'll You'll try to make a stroke and it won't even really leave anything behind. And then your, your anticipation of creating this variety here uh, becomes even more of a random chance. Now, remember, I want to also land well on my paper. And that is... The other thing that I think is really important, I mean, some people say it's just not that important. Yes, you can struggle and accomplish a lot of things. There are some world-class uh, you know, artists out there that are creating amazing things with all different kinds of methods. But I still think that this uh, five-pencil method has always worked in the long run best for me, keeping so many options open. I've found it has never locked me into something I can't add to, refine, and so I always like my tapered stroke, the one with the, uh, you know, the pointed ends. It's a little lighter in each end, a little bit more of a, of a value in the middle. And that in itself lends, you know, when you shorten that up, you, you can practice doing them very short. And that in itself helps create that variation in the, in the fur on this uh, horse that is really uh, an advantage. So um, 
So we want to look for a few of these. Every once in a while, we'll maybe have a little opportunity to create something a little darker. And then we know that these are laying over the top. It's almost like shingling. It just keeps going, you know, under, and something's under that, and something's under that. But we have to have that opportunity to show that it's darkest between my fingers where there's less, uh, where there's less light, right at the place where it disappears. You watch this shadow. It gets wider, not only because of the contour of my hand, but because my finger's right up to it. And so... Uh, when we can take advantage of that basic rule, uh, we'll always be able to have our minds read that this is the part that goes under, the darkest part, you know, is the part that goes under. And then this is shingled over the top. Now, like on here, it might be a good thing that I've actually had this happen where I'm actually working on the rough side of the paper. It doesn't seem like it's much. You really have to, you know, pay attention. And I've given a few tricks in my free lessons in that uh, you can use the light to determine which one is the heavier texture. Uh, some, you know, claim they can feel it. That's fine. If you can, some can't. And so it's best just to have a foolproof method and you put that light off to an angle and shine it across the surface of your paper, just like the sun at a sunset. Uh, it's very low in the horizon, and when you put your paper uh, at a level that that light is coming from an angle, just like you would in the evening sun or the morning sunrise, then you'll be able to have shadows cast, and you'll see that they're longer or shorter, and it'll help you expose the texture to the paper. So, now, because of that, though, I think that I would like to come in and maybe clean up something, make it a little sharper. Uh, and so when you need to do something like that, uh, I think it's best not to do everything with the 4-H, but to clean something up, I don't see anything wrong with, with that, uh, to make sure there's a clean edge to a, a line or uh, there's a place that you can get in there and do a little sharper uh, V uh, so that you can take advantage of value as well as refinement, you know, and the 4-H does that quite well. But again, I probably wouldn't use this all because I want to be able to do something else very important that we'll do in a little bit. So it's okay to use it as a stage or just for the time being when something's appropriate to clean up. But it is really nice to be able to have this extra lead that we put on when we're using a little softer pencil. I just don't want it to be a dull pencil and I don't want the strokes to be too close together because then uh, when we look at it from a distance especially, we're going to start seeing it as a solid. And even though this may look almost solid to you, I, I want to encourage you to try to find variance in here uh, in value so that you can have darks and lights just like you would in this more open space, but only it's in a darker place. So you would have a little darker lines in between, just like you'll see these darker places on the fur here. And then if you can glide on, uh, oh, I'm here, I'm drawing over there. Here, you, if you can glide on with that tapered stroke, you end up by being able to create an edge that isn't like this. If we were coming up to that blaze and we just started putting uh, uh, lines, you know, creating the hair that are blunt because we landed too suddenly, instead of a tapered stroke, with, when you have a tapered stroke, and you land softly and you take off, uh, just like an airplane would on the runway, then you have the opportunity to incorporate that white hair into it much, much easier. And you can come back in and you can create a few of those Vs that will go into that, that uh, uh, lighter hair. It's so easy to, to just dab off something. And if you see a gain uh, in a place where there's a little darker spot or or even if you've tried to refine everything and there's a little darker place, sometimes it's good to look uh, at this overall and just kind of squint your eyes if you're having a hard time seeing the variances. And you'll see where maybe there's a dot that stands out. Maybe it's just distracting. We want everything to be a complement. We don't want everything to be exactly the same. We love the variance. 
We just don't want somebody to something to take over. And so it's it's sometimes the fact that you'll have a number of dark areas and they will all add a natural quality to the overall area of fur you're doing, but it won't just have one dot standing out. And so we want to be able to avoid that, but you can come right back in anytime you do that and you can just tap it off. Just like I just took off that one. I just took off that one. And if you don't take them off, if you don't take the time, then every time you go over it, it gets darker. So here's one there. Here's one there. If I felt it wasn't something I really wanted, maybe I want it to be a little different angle. Maybe I want it to be a little longer. I don't want it to be so round and such a polka dot. Uh, then I would come in there and just touch it off. And I can touch it off, remember, because I'm regulating the amount of pressure I'm putting on. So it's really, I think, an advantage to just think along these lines so that you can go ahead and have everything working to your advantage, every stroke, you know, becoming uh, an opportunity to do two or three things all at once instead of just coming through with each stage and, uh, and expecting uh, to have to do every facet of realism uh, and uh, keep going over it and over it. I like to not overwork my drawings, and yet there's time. There's a time and place to really take the opportunity and have the patience to refine something as well. And you'll settle into what's important and what's not. So here we are with a little darker. Now this is something else that's happening. My eye was supposed to be much darker than this. And because I'm just showing you a little demonstration, this is going to become quite a bit darker than what... Uh, it would normally be if I was working on this horse overall. I still would be going back up and I would be strengthening up my uh, darker values. I started with the eyes and a few other areas because I want them to uh, be the deepest, darkest places. And I, I put some uh, foundation in there with my 4H and it just gradually is, is able to build up and build up. Again, because I'm building it up and I'm being careful, I can go ahead and erase that. For the most part, I can get this entire uh, a developed eye here off. And so instead of coming in here with the thought, well, this is a dark place, I'll just grab my dark pencil and I'll just go for it. Uh, it's better to sneak up on it because it won't, it won't hold on to your pencil near as much and you'll be able to modify it. Maybe you might even want to change it because it's a little in the wrong place. Or maybe you want to change the shape of it. And those things are all wonderful to be able to do if you indeed can make the changes and not have to scar your paper uh, and, and have all these problems that way. So let's, let's just keep coming here. I'm going to come in with a little bit of a crossing. I hope you can see that's what I'm doing. That also is going to add a little bit to the value. It's going to depend on how much I linger there and how many strokes I put in there. But I still want some of that variance, that variance in value, to be part of my drawing. I don't want to just forget that I'm working with hair, little short hairs with different facets, different lengths, and it's not going to show that if I make it all solid. So now um, there might be a few places where I'll come back in and I'll get into these lighter areas now and make sure I'm keeping them lighter. If they start, if I'm working in these areas and they start becoming equal with this, well then I would probably want to come in either and darken this up a little bit more, or I would want to tap something back. And I can tap away, a, not away, but I can tap back a, a, uh, an area that I want to be a little bit more highlighted in here. Maybe I want a little bit more highlight through there. So I can come in here and I can evenly take something off of the highest points. And that's usually where your darkest value is. If you haven't pressed too hard, your darkest value is sitting on there on the top, just waiting for your word. And you'll, it'll come off if you want it to. So here we've got a little bit more of that taken off to create that highlight. Okay, now, there's uh, the reason I'm mentioning that eye again is not only because we want to make sure we keep all of our values in the right order. Otherwise, if I'm just working on this and everything else stays light and the things that I initially thought I would make darker start becoming almost equal with this, then this is where our attention is going to go eventually. 
because our minds are going to tell us, well, I wonder what that's dark there for. And it's going to go to the greatest contrast with the paper. We already have a white blaze, so we want to be able to tone this down in some way. So in normal circumstances, I'm going to want to continue increasing my value ever, ever, ever so slightly to make sure it's ahead of this. And it's not even beginning to be in the same category. Even though I would avoid going as dark as I can, because that kind of limits, you know, whether you're going to be able to show dimension and contour within a dark area. I always like to keep something in reserve. Uh, so I wouldn't use my 4B up here. I might use my 4B if I have to at all at the very last, because it'll give me an opportunity to maybe make something just a little darker in a certain place. And then I'll be able to go ahead and also show something a little lighter. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, uh, a highlight in the eye. And if I need to clean it up even more than that, well, I can go ahead and, and use my Mono Zero. If you're interested in these Mono Zeros, they're a wonderful alternative to the electric eraser going by the way of the dinosaur. And, uh, and they're so versatile. You can take nice strokes. If you're used to using your pencil, you'll be able to do one of these very nicely. And so that's also another secret of opening something back up when you may have gotten a little bit more in there than what you want. So let's just try that. We want to be careful with this, just like getting a pencil that's a little dull and making too wide of a line. We can end up by having this become uh, worn off on the edges. I like to cut mine straight off so I have this whole perimeter of an edge on this rounded eraser. That whole outside edge can now become a sharp edge that I can uh, use. And I break off this uh, little pocket clip because I'm not going to carry this around in my pocket, and this helps me then to be able to do exactly what I was saying with my pencil and rotate this so I can always have a fresh edge. And then you can lay this down on something, and when you're ready, you can cut this straight off, you know, and, uh, you know, it's good to have this uh, on a firm foundation, and then just slice this off, just like you're going to slice a carrot or something, and, uh, and take that little piece off of there, and it will freshen up the edge again. And uh, so, anyway, we can come in there with one of these, just taking a nice, clean, tapered stroke. We don't want to have these blunt either, so it's really nice to be able to glide on and glide off just because you're used to doing it all the time. Sometimes when it's hard to learn something, sometimes people will say, well, I don't think that's necessary, but... It, it really is a great opportunity, again, for you to expand your horizons. And, uh, and I realize that not everybody uh, can accomplish the same things, and you might have to make some adjustments, but try, because sometimes it's worth the effort. I've had people in my classes that have gone uh, from drawing, uh, you know, like a left-hander does from the top of the page and adjust it so it's mirroring what I do instead of coming around here from the top and having to do a reverse stroke like so. And uh, it's amazing what we can train ourselves to do. Uh, people who have lost their arms can learn how to draw with their feet. And that's just a matter of determination. And it's incredible what you can do. I've had people even change from left to right uh, when they're drawing, uh, just because they decided that, that would really be an advantage. And, uh, and so you can do virtually anything you want to do, and, unless you just uh, decide you're not going to try to learn and then there, are, I realize there are limitations as, as well. But I'm trying to, again, open up as many opportunities as I possibly can for you. So if you keep drawing with this method, you'll realize that there's a lot of things down the line that will just become so much easier when you get some of these basic mechanics down and the principles. Now, what I'm trying to do, and I think we're getting close enough now, where I can bring in this... Uh, you know, drawing of burdock that I did before, and you can start seeing what I'm trying to create here. And I have a, a range of value in here. It gets a little darker here uh, as it's going to go into this maybe a little recess and it's coming up and over. It's going to drop over the edge and we're going to have a slight texture in here. Uh, the texture started getting smoothed out, you know, a little bit, but you can still see there's an influence in there of that, uh, that curve and that flow around all the contours. And, uh, and so uh, there's also many different variations of value and intensities, you know, of the stroke and also a little variation in the direction. 
So if you've ever done something like stippling, this would be uh, something similar. Uh, if I'm coming in here and I realize it's a little bit irregular, but in a way I still want to be able to show that it's a little darker in here, maybe a little darker through this place here, a little lighter through here. Well, I want to be able to maybe depend on a random stroke here and there uh, to suggest that an area is a little darker instead of getting too dark. And then when you have a dark, dark stroke like that on there, it might be that this is just an isolated one. So you could actually you know, come in there and say, okay, uh, I'll just create a couple other darker ones along in there and see if that's actually starting to create what you need to have these little variations that give it a natural quality and also not having this one mark stand out. On the other hand, if it is too dark, and that's very possible, just come in there and touch it off. Maybe put a stroke beside it, you know, or a little, little closer that's not quite so contrasty, and you'll start having the opportunity to have an overall impression instead of just having that, uh, that one uh, variation that just causes a distraction. Okay. Now, what I want to be able to do to take advantage of the softer lead is to be able to come in and not have to draw in all these light areas. I'm going to try not to do that because the more I try to fill all the spaces, the more I'm going to end up again with a solid tone. I'm not going to have that wonderful texture that I want to maintain through this. And so I'm going to use my brush. It's really a nice advantage when you have one of these soft Lang nickel brushes. There might be a couple other ones around that I'm not familiar with. Uh, but I really like these. They're a very, very inexpensive brush, and it's camel hair. One of the softest uh, bristles you're ever going to come across. And so it doesn't, you don't have to bear down on it very hard. And it just takes some of that extra lead from the softer pencils, and it distributes it into the spaces. Well, naturally, taking a little bit of the extra off of the other pencil is going to a, a little bit cut down on the harsh darker tones just a little bit and it's going to take some of that extra and just dust in those lighter areas and it's not going to look like it's something that is drawn in there but now it isn't bright white because look at how many other places we're going to want to take advantage of a brighter white we don't want a bunch of bright white streaks going through here and then as I do that I can come in here and now I can continue working on the places that need a little bit more value here and there and making sure again that not every stroke is exactly the same direction they're not too long taking in consideration the length of the hair that would be on this horse's face versus the mane or the bangs of the mane or maybe maybe if it was a horse in winter I've seen horse uh, horses with a little longer hair and you can suggest all those things very well by paying attention to the length and where you break the the uh, you know the plane of a stroke where you uh, come in with a, a stroke next to it or crisscross over it or whatever but I want my strokes to be uh, you know at least subtly evident and not become solid so this is why it's 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 kind of relaxing I don't have to worry about trying to have all these strokes in exactly the same length and exactly the same spacing I can come in here and just be doing something very natural as long as I'm paying attention that I'm not plugging it up and plugging it up would just be filling in all the spaces so that it becomes a solid now naturally we don't have a lot of other things that are going to help us it, it would be nice to be able to uh, eventually come in here and do a little bit of this light area but I can go both ways in creating uh, something that is going to integrate into the white hair again because basically what we have with the darker is we're coming out from underneath the hair that's on top of it uh, in some of these uh, uh, prints you can see that there's actually an intersection there's a central place like a like the hub on a on a bike wheel the spokes all come out from a central area and so that helps you understand that as the hair is coming out and we're gradually working this way that this is going to be over the top of that we're going to continue coming from underneath and from underneath and even in the light area we're going to come from underneath only with a much lighter 
and clean stroke. So we'd probably use more of the 4H, a very much harder pencil, and uh, to create that. And then also, remember, you've got your opportunity to reverse out by having your, uh, your Mono Zero with a nice clean edge. So I want this to be a little bit random. You can see that it's not just, it just all coming to the same place. And it also kind of changes directions here too. In a little bit, it's coming down like this. Then you get over here and it's maybe, you know, broadening out this way again. That current again, something I think very important. If you want to have something uh, that, that is really complementing every wonderful characteristic of your horse, there's just a couple more of the things that you can pay attention to. So using the appropriate pencil, I see something dark through here. Still want to use my tapered stroke because I want to variegate into it, in, in and out of it. I can always make it more cutting edge or more pronounced by uh, coming in there and intensifying a value, but I don't want to do that initially. I don't want to have blunt strokes. I want to glide on, even though it's a little short stroke, and gradually increase that value until I have something like this. So there might be a few places that we can, we can go ahead and, as you squint your eyes with this too, and come up with something that is gradually going to take you, you know, closer and closer to that. Remember, you can shorten up strokes. You can vary the direction ever so slightly and still overall be maintaining your contour of this animal. Think of how many things would be just pretty much the same as this. All kinds of dogs and cats and giraffes and antelope and everybody would be uh, you know, something that you could really take advantage of the same procedure. That was kind of chunky. Remember too, I don't want you to forget about this. If you want to have something that's not quite so stark, so you take that pointed end of your eraser and you pinch it until it becomes a, a wider, more substantial blade. And then you can come in here and you can take out more of a uh, you know, a line. You still have that opportunity to touch it if you want. Just, just lift something gently off the paper. Or you can take a stroke. And it's better, again, to follow a tapered style with this. Whatever you do, as much as you can use that tapered stroke, it's going to complement. The removal of your graphite with your eraser, the putting on the graphite with the eraser, even the even the uh, using the brush when I come on I don't want to come in here and just go like this I want to you know sweep on and sweep off the thing that makes this nice is it has corners and it isn't very wide and so you can continue brushing certain areas without having an over brush into an area you don't want that cast into but you can see the value that I'm starting to get here that's getting pretty exciting so let's go ahead and maybe make a few more dark strokes We can take a few dark strokes just for that little variance, and you might continue on. I just don't want this to suddenly start looking too dark as I'm concentrating on having this become a contrast with the blaze because I would rather come in here later when I balance out all my values and not be too dark here, but just enough. Just enough. Okay. So now, I'm going to take that brush, I'm going to take advantage of that extra lead again, and when I brush something that has a texture to it like this, then usually I can anticipate that that is going to be still a texture when I get finished brushing. Um, and also, if I, if I ever had to, I could even go across. I don't want to necessarily do that here. But if I came here and I put each stroke next to each other and made a continuous tone, that if I don't have any gaps going this way, everything I go over here will maintain that texture because I'm going the opposite way. That's why I'm encouraging also not to go the same way and continue getting darker and darker and put too many strokes because you end up by starting to lose the texture. 
you, you put more of the same thing in there and it gets harder to differentiate the variances that you have, both in texture and value. So I hope that this gives you a little bit of an idea about what can happen. And I might even go up to my 2B if I feel like it's necessary, as long as, again, I'm not coming in there and overpowering everything. I can start fine-tuning the contrast in these different areas as long as I continue, you know, having that transition from light to dark and it isn't just a sudden place. You really watch your, your uh, uh, reference, uh, your subject, so that you can, you know, try to do it justice as you try to capture the best uh, of its anatomy, of its character, and I consider this character as well. And so I can come in here ever so slightly and continue adding a little value. And that first stroke may be a little dark. Maybe it needs a few friends so that it'll tone it down. But I think you can probably start to see that we're getting a variance of from a, you know, not a real dark value, but a little lighter. Slides into a little recession here. Comes up over and it becomes dark as it comes down. And you, this can be more refined if it needs to be in a more concentrated place then you just come in there and add a little bit more in there. And if it needs to have a little bit more of a highlight in a couple places, now because you've brushed that extra value into those areas, you have something that can be removed. And, uh, and I think that's just an exciting thing. Love, again, not only to have the options for myself, but to have you have all the options that you can possibly have so that you can stay in control and that certainly makes it a lot more fun drawing. So I hope some of these tips have helped you and uh, there's not a whole lot of time with these and I'd like to be able to maybe come back one more time and, and uh, give you a few other ideas about what you can do to achieve something like this. And uh, so we'll, we'll come back another time uh, you know, in this series one more time and don't forget that you have the opportunity to pick these up, uh, you know, very soon. And uh, the DVDs and the downloads will be something that maybe you can watch over and over and over again. And again, repetitious is so great. So uh, let's take one more look at this uh, drawing here and just see uh, that we've we've gone over some of the contrast and and the texture and the direction, the flow. And I think we're starting to come uh, close to what I was trying to accomplish in here, and our students were as well. We have so many wonderful contrasts, and yet it seems like there's a lot of the same thing. It's hair. Sometimes it gets scary for people, you know, to have that much hair in their drawing. So anyway, I hope that you'll all look forward to working with me on this. It's always fun drawing with you all, at least, uh, you know, imagining that I am. I know some of you leave... Uh, you know, messages to me every once in a while saying that they had enjoyed drawing uh, along with me. And I try to make it as personal as possible. So uh, again, I hope this was useful to you and, uh, and look forward to having you share with me again and letting me share with you. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that lesson and uh, hopefully it inspired you to take some of these techniques and and try them on your own drawings, whether that's a horse or another animal or even people. I think one thing that was pretty clear from this series is that drawing hair on a person and drawing hair on a horse is actually pretty similar in the way that you approach it. But uh, anyway, this has been part three of our three-part series. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. But don't worry, as promised, uh, you know, I was saying that we've been working really hard to package this set, um, get the DVDs and downloads ready to go. And on Wednesday, we're going to be able to launch it. We've got everything wrapped up and we're just putting the finishing touches. So Wednesday, be looking for a final video from Daryl. He's going to share just a few more, uh, a little more insight about what it took to draw this project, some of the tools he used and some of the, maybe some of the issues that he ran into, things to look out for. And again, that's on Wednesday. We'll be launching. We'll send you an email to your inbox letting you know that the video is up and it's ready to roll. And one thing to get really excited about is that when we launch this, we're going to be launching it at a heavily discounted rate uh, just during our introductory offer. And uh, there'll also be a really cool gift that we're giving away with it when you make a purchase. So something to be excited about, something to look forward to. 
Again, we'll be letting you know in your email when, uh, when it's officially available to bring home. So again, thank you so much for your time and your support. We really appreciate it. If you have any questions, just go ahead and leave those down below the video. We'll get back to you as quick as possible. So thank you very much and have a great day.